mentioned before, I'm Mauricio Vasquez. I work as a software engineer for Microsoft. I'm part of the Kingfold team there. In this presentation, I will introduce very quickly what is eBPF. I will introduce the inspector uh, gadget pro uh, project that we are working in. And then I will talk about how we can measure the overhead of those eBPF programs and the memory that those programs are using. And I show you a tool that we implement in Inspector Gadget to do that. So before going into the details, I want to introduce eBPF very quickly. Probably you are already aware of what eBPF is, but anyway, to be sure that we are all on the same page. So eBPF is a uh, in kernel virtual machine. What it means is that we are able to take programs from the users, and we are able to run those programs in the kernel context. Mm, the, the important part of eBPF is that we are able to change the behavior of the kernel without having to recompile the kernel. Before eBPF, when we wanted to implement a change on the kernel, we have to send a patch to the Linux kernel, kernel mailing list. We have to discuss that with the community. And maybe that was going to be accepted. And after some years, that version of the Linux kernel will be ab available for our customers. What I mean is that from the time I got a requirement to have a new feature on the kernel, and the time I have that version running on our customers, maybe there could be two, three years. So the deployment cycle there was very slow. By eBPA, we are able to make that much faster because we are able to change the behavior of the kernel just by injecting some programs without having to recompile, without having to change the kernel. Uh, in eBPA, we have different use cases. Those are the three main, wine, main ones. The first one is tracing, so this is to understand what is going on in the system. For instance, what are the new processes that are being created, the, the network connections that are created, file or access to files and so on. Another very important use case of eBPF is networking. So by running those eBPF programs, we are able to modify the content of the packets in the Linux kernel. So by using eBPF, we are able to implement different network appliances like NATs, routers, or actually in Kubernetes, we have different vendors that implement the Kubernetes networking using eBPF, so like Cilium, Calico, and similar. Another use case of eBPF is security. So those, in those programs, we can control. We can say, OK, this action is allowed, or this action is denied. For instance, we can say, OK, a given uh, user ID is able to access this file or not. And yeah, just to clarify and just to make this point very important, eBPF is becoming a fundamental part of the Linux kernel. I will say that this is one of the hottest topics in, in the Linux. So there are more and more features implemented in eBPF, and each time there are more projects that are using eBPF. Actually, this is very hard to keep track of the new projects that are using eBPF each day. Just to show you some examples of the projects that are using eBPF, so we have very well-known projects there like Cilium, the CNI for Kubernetes, we have Calico, we have Inspector Gadget that I will introduce in a second. And actually, that slide is not complete at all because there are so many projects that we are not able to keep track of all of them. OK, so I want to present one of those projects. This is Inspector Gadget. Inspector Gadget is a collection of tools we call those gadgets to debug and introspect uh, and inspect Kubernetes applications and resources. Of course, we use eBPF as our building technology. We inject eBPF programs in the kernel to understand what is going on on a Kubernetes cluster. And Inspector Gadget is well integrated with Kubernetes. We provide, when something happens in the cluster, we provide, we enrich the events with Kubernetes information. For instance, what is the pod? What is the namespace where a given event is happening? And we also provide a kubectl plugin to make it easier for users to use this tool. Mm, in Inspector Gadget, we have different categories of gadgets, different categories of tools. We have advisors. Those are tools that we, that we use to suggest uh, configurations on the cluster. For instance, we can use that, a gadget that we call setcon advisor to suggest a second profile to apply to a pod or to suggest a network policy 
for an application. We have other kind of gadgets that are called auditors. Those are to check when a given security configuration, when a given security profile is blocking something on the application. For instance, if we have a second profile by using this tool, we are able to understand if that second profile is blocking some of the system calls that our applications are trying to run. We have profilers. Those are to check the performance of the system, like, for instance, to get in the latency of the block I.O. A, a subsystem on the kernel. We have snap shooters. Those are for getting the status of a subsystem. For instance, for getting the list of processes of a given pod or the list of sockets or similars. We have toppers. Those are one of my favorites. Those tools allow to understand what is the resource that is the most used in a given class. For instance, there is one gadget that is called PileTop. By running that gadget, we are able to understand what is the file within the cluster that is used the most. So we are able to understand also who is the pod that is doing those operations on those files. So if there is, let's say, if you are having a problem with high I.O. usage, you could use this tool to understand what is the file that is being used and who is doing that activity on that file. And finally, we have tracers. Those are like the more traditional ones, those are to get events on, on the cluster. So yeah, as I mentioned before, when a process is created, when a network connection is done, when a D DNS request is sent. This is the architecture of inspector gadgets. So we run inspector gadget as a daemon set on the clusters. There is a inspector gadget pod per each, per each node on the cluster, and then there we use eBPF. We inject those eBPF programs in the kernel to get the information. So as the kernel is shared between all the pods running on the same node, we are able to get information or better, get the activity that the different pods are doing. The user interacts with inspector gadget by using this kubectl gadget plugin. And yeah, in the current implementation, we uh, implement inspector gadget as an operator. So there is a custom resource, and that's the reason why we go through the API server there. OK, let me show you a demonstration of how Inspector Gadget works. OK, so the first thing I want to show you is how to install Inspector Gadget. In order to install Inspector Gadget, we can go to the Inspector Gadget repo. And then we have the different releases there. And for each release, we have the different kubectl gadget plugins compiled for different operating systems and architectures. In this case, I'm running a Linux AMD64 machine, so I'm going to take that binary. And the only thing that I have is to download that binary into my machine. This is a, actually this is a compressed file, so after that I have to uncompress that file. And in that file there is the, the binary and the license. That's, those are the things that we have there. And we can execute the binary. But if we want to install that as a kubectl gadget plugin, as a kubectl plugin, sorry, we have to copy that to a path that is avail available to kubectl. Right, so now we can use inspector gadget by typing kubectl gadget. So this is going to execute our binary. And there we have the different categories of gadgets that I showed you before. But actually, right now we have only installed the client plugin. We haven't deployed inspector gadget to the cluster. So if we check what pods do we have in the gadget name space? We only have, we don't have any pods. So we have to use this kubectl gadget deploy to install inspector gadget in the cluster. In this case, this command will create all the resources that are needed for it to work. It will pull the images and create the different pods on the different nodes. Right, so inspector gadget is installed. We can start using that. Mm, again, we have the different categories that I showed you before, snap shooters, tracers, stoppers, and so on. Let's, let me create a pod to run some commands, so just to have something that, that I can monitor. This is just going to be a very simple bitsy boss 
pod where I'm going to execute some commands. OK, so let's start by using one of the simplest. This is trace ESSEC. This is to understand when new processes are created on the cluster. So in this case, I'm tracing all the new processes that are created on the default namespace. So, so far, nothing is, is being created. If I go to my pod and I execute a command, you can see that on the top, we, we get that there was a pink command. We have the arguments that we pass to the command. And on the left, we have all the information related to Kubernetes, like the namespace, the node, the pod, and the container where that event happen. There are different kind of tracers. We have a lot of them. For instance, let me show you a different one. In this case, open. This is to understand the different files that are open on the cluster. And by using this, I can monitor different uh, namespaces, for instance. So in this case, I'm checking all the files that are open on the cube system namespace. As, as you can see there, there is cube process, core DNS that are open in different files there. And I can also use this dash A to monitor all the files in the, all the namespaces at the same time. And just to finish about the tracers, I want to show you one of my favorites. This is to trace different TCP connections that are created. So if I go down to the pod and I try to access the Inspector Gadget website, we can see on the top the different connections that our pod tried to create, sorry. So we have the command that created the connection. We have some information about the source, destination address, source, and destination ports. And again, on the left, we have all the information about the Kubernetes uh, instance, the Kubernetes pod that was performing that operation. There is another category. This is just to show you different categories that we have. So for instance, let me print the processes on the default namespace. So only, we only have the shell there. If I start pink, on my pod and I print the processes again, you can see that there we have the, the pink process. So this is to show the process that are running right now on the cluster. We have the same for sockets. So those are the sockets that actually were created when I tried to access the inspector gadget website before. So this tool is to be used with Kubernetes. Inspector gadget has to be used with Kubernetes, but what about if you want to trace containers that are not created by Kubernetes? So we have a different tool that is called Local Gadget that's very similar to Inspector Gadget, but in this case, we are able to trace containers that are not created by Kubernetes. For instance, Docker containers, container D, and so on. So in the release, we also have this binary, Local Gadget, so we can download the binary for the architecture. This is only supported in Linux at this point. So again, this is just the same. Let's get the binary, let's uncompress the binary, and if I execute local gadget, I get this. So the idea here is to have all the gadgets that we have available on inspector gadget also in local gadget, but we are in the process of transforming all of them to be also compatible with inspector gadget. So this is some ongoing work right now. OK, so yeah. One of the commands that we can use is to list the containers. This is going to list all the containers that this tool is able to find on the host. So Docker, Containerd, Cryo are the runtimes that we support. So in this case, there was only one container. If I create another container, if I print again, you can see that this is the name that Docker give to the container. So let's trace that container. We can use local gadget, trace ASIC. So the syntax is very similar to to inspector gadget, in this case, we have to specify the container name. That's the name of the container. And again, if I execute, actually I mess up a little bit with the terminal. If I execute a command on the container, you can see also there that a that, uh, pink command was executed. Okay, so let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so, so far I show you what is eBPF and a project that uses eBPF. So eBPF is being used in so many different projects, but how do we measure the performance overhead of those programs? Well, 
eBPF programs are run in the kernel. So if we use a standard tool like PA, PS, TOP, HTOP, those are not going to have any visibility on those programs because those are not user space processes. But from the kernel version 5.1, it provides some statistics about the eBPF programs that are running there. This is exposed to this PS interface of the kernel and BPF tool, that is like the tool that we use to handle different things related to BPA, BPF, uh, supports those statistics. So what I mean is that by using a BPF tool, we can access those statistics. So there is this BPF prop show command, but before securing that command, I have to enable the collection of statistics on the kernel. This is disabled by default because there is, there is some overhead there, so we have to enable that manually. And yeah. Once I execute this BPF proc show command, I get two kind of statistics. I get the number of executions of a given program and the duration of those executions. But this BPF tool doesn't provide any information about what is the program that is used the most, what is the program that is taking the more of the CPU. It just prints a list of different uh, programs there. So let me show you a demo of this BPF tool proc show. So the first thing that I have to do in this case is to start any project that uses eBPF. So in this case, I will just reuse Inspector Gadget. So the idea is to have some eBPF programs in the kernel to be able to see the statistics of them. In this case, I have to SSH into the node because I have to run BPF tool on the same node that the different programs are running. I have to enable the collection of statistics on the kernel. And when I do this BPF proc show, I get the list of different BPF programs that are running on that kernel. And on the right part, we got the information about the runtime, uh, the, yeah, the time that is taken to execute those programs. This is like the sum of all the executions and the number of executions of those programs. But yeah, as I mentioned, there is no any way to sort this output. This is true that we call use JQ zone scripting to, to order that, but that's a little bit difficult to do by hand. Okay, so let me go back to the presentation again. So this is we, we created this eBPF top gadget in Inspector Gadget. And the idea here is that we are going to use the same API that is provided by the kernel to get the statistics of those eBPF programs, but we are going to show those statistics in an easier to interpret way to the users. So we, are, we provide a mechanism to sort the programs that are the most used, the programs that uh, consume the most memory and so on. And we, additionally to the CPU utilization, we also have some heuristics to show what is the memory that is used by those uh, eBPF programs. And yeah, let me show you a demo of this eBPF top gadget tool. So again, I will just start anything that is using eBPF on the, on the top part of the screen. In this case, I just reuse an inspector gadget. So I'm using inspector gadget to understand how inspector gadget perform, but uh, on the top, I could be running Cilium, Falco, whatever thing that is using eBPF. So on the bottom, I will use this kubectl gadget top eBPF command. And by default, this is going to show, to show us each second what are the programs that are being run on the kernel and the statistics within that second. So what it means is that in the last second, a given program was executed two times, six times, and also we have the runtime, the time that those programs took to execute within that second. We also provide some information about the memory that the maps or that those programs are using there. And yeah, in this case, I can also sort the output using different uh, parameters. For instance, let's sort the output 
by having on top the program that is taking the most time to execute, this within the same second. So we can see that there is a PROC ID ADC is there that takes most of the time in this case. Um, yeah, so there are some columns why, that we don't print by default. So those common columns show the total time, the total execution time of those programs, not within each second, but from the time I started the, this tool. So in this case, I will start the tool, I will show those columns, and I will sort by the total runtime. So as you can see, this counter is not reset each second, but in this time, we are increasing over the whole execution of the tool. The same happens for the colon run count uh, in this case. So yeah, this is a way to see what are the programs that are consuming the most CPU on our uh, system. We also support JSON output, so in case you want to take the output of this and create a an script or pass that to a different tool, that's possible. And yeah, wh what are the limitations of this tool? So in ABPF, there is, a con there is a concept that is called take call. So this is something like, there is an ABPF program that performs a call to another ABPF program, but there is no any return. So the first program is replaced by the second one. In those cases, we don't provide any statistics. This is a limitation of the kernel. Kernel people say that it was too difficult to implement. There was a big performance overhead. So in those cases, there is no any statistics that we can provide. And also the memory usage that we are showing there is just an approximation. We are showing the memory usage as the memory that the ABPF maps require. So ABPF maps are a key value storage. So just to calculate the memory usage of that, we take the size of the key, the size of the value, and we multiply by the mass number of entries that we can have on that map. So this is like an approximation. And also, ABPF programs can be shared between different, ABPF maps, sorry, can be shared between different ABPF programs. So we report the memory that all the maps that a given ABPF program is using. So what it means is that if two programs are sharing the same maps, we are going to report that memory twice. But actually, there is only one allocation of those maps. OK, I think this is pretty much all. If you want to know more information about this, we have this blog post where we provide some more examples by using Falco, Cilion, and also some information about the implementation of this tool. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions that you can have. So, whoops, could I get the mic? So, let's go ahead and have questions. Do ha anyone have questions from our CEO? <laughs> All right, we'll start here and we'll go to you next. Could you also repeat the question? Yeah, so if I understand correctly, the question is about the policy because we are able to access so many confidential information with this tool. Yeah, this is, this is a very good question. Right now, we require all privileges on the cluster to deploy this tool. So after this tool is deployed, you can access everything on the cluster. And I will say it depends on your company policies. So we are using this tool internally in Microsoft, and we have a process that our customer engineers require to ask the customer to install this tool before using that. So it, you as a company will handle if you are able to install that, if you want to install that in a given cluster. Did I reply your question? Yep, anyone, yeah, that's right. Anyone with access with the Q API could access this. Actually, that's a very good question. We haven't looked into the details of giving some specific permissions to this, something like having a different cube config, a different user that can use that. So far, anyone with the cube, with access to cube API can run those tools. An interesting question that we're left with still. 
Yeah. Okay, your question? Uh, I'm going to ask because you stole my question. Okay. <laughs> so this seems to be on everyone's mind. All right, other questions? Ah, yours. So eBPF is now, well, actually eBPF is supported in Linux. It was initially created for Linux. There is some work going on on Windows, but we don't support Inspector Gadget on Windows yet. Probably this is something that we are going to do, not, not sure, but yeah, this is about eBPF. This is very interesting that it was created for Linux, but it's becoming a standard in, in in the industry, so different operating systems are trying also to implement eBPF, and there is some work going on to create an standardization. So all operating systems should be able to run the same eBPF programs. Of course, not now, but that is the idea in the future. So I think this means that it's Linux, or sorry, it is kernel dependent for your operating system, whether or not you would be able to run eBPF tools, including inspect inspector gadget, correct? Yeah, that's Brilliant, correct. okay, restated, <laughs> lovely. All right, uh, any other further questions? Really, we've answered them all? I don't believe it. All right, well let's say thank you to Mauricio and then we'll thank have a couple of minutes break.